I still um, desire to look good and I still um, appreciate the attention of other people and I have to continually lay that down and continually remember that that is not a goal that I need to have in my life. You're going to have some bad nights where you just go binge again and don't beat yourself up about it. Just, you know, live it and, and just get over it and, and try to do better the next night. And I'd say every year it's better. Every six months it's probably better, but it's a healing process for me. And Hi, I'm Laverne Tripp. Welcome to Born to Be Free. In the last few episodes, we have discovered that we were powerless, that there was a power greater than us, and we made a decision to surrender to that power. We examined ourselves. We found out what the real problem was. We asked him to forgive us. We gave it to him. Now that we're living this new life, now that we've been forgiven, we've discovered a wonderful life, and we're on it, and everything's going good. What happens when we fail? I know what it is to fail. I know what it is to be discouraged. As many of you watching, you know too. Well, today we're going to tell you what to do because there is a solution. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's too good to be true, but it is. Stay tuned. You know, it's easy to love the lovable. I found that out. Mm -hmm. But loving the unlovable is a doggone hard <laughs> thing to do. You know what I'm saying? And, mm -hmm. and, and Jesus, he didn't make it easy. You know, love the unlovable. You know, turn the other cheek. You know. Keeps pointing to bless Tiny. Yeah, You're but, a brave but, man. But, brave man. But, but you know, bless the bless the, those who persecute you. Yeah. Yes. Pray for And I'm going, wow. Wow, this is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense. And sometimes I fail miserably. But you know, sometimes I see somebody and I just can't stand it. The reason I came to something, like Mark said a while ago, I, I see a piece of me in them, yes, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But there's some people I just want to beat the snot out of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm under command right. from my master to love that person. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, I'm trying and I'm doing a lot better job than I used to. I mean, I, you know, you, anybody can fake it, mm -hmm. but I mean where I really feel it. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting closer to that. Amen. But boy, it sure is hard to do. I mean, I wish, you know, because if I don't, I'd just be one of those pretend Christians if I told you I had it all together. Well, I don't have that all together. <laughs> Love is not what you say, think, or feel. No, it's, it's an action. Love is what you do. Right. Yeah. He brings these stinkers, that people mm -hmm. that require extra grace, mm -hmm. into our lives for a reason. Yes. And that yeah. reason is not to aggravate us. I know the plans I have mm -hmm. for you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's my response that he is really interested in. And that's not just a one-way street. Um, you know, in saying that, I think you just released so many people watching this program because I think many yeah. people assume that the command to love means they have to become ethereal. Mm -hmm. That when they're approached with the yeah. unlovely, when people are offensive and rude and cruel and so forth, that they're somehow going to be so transcendent mm -hmm. that they'll be yeah. beyond being even affected by that. And that's the very thing that kept me from opening myself up to the concept of love. I thought, good grief, I will never become mm -hmm. a Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. And if that's what I have to be to love, forget it. I'm not even going to try. Yeah. But when you explain that love is what you do, that right. means that you don't have to pretend that what the person that's is right. doing is right. You are at liberty at times to even point out that they are wrong. You don't have to feel that the whole thing is lovely yeah. and sweet. You may be angry yeah. and you may be hurt and it's okay so yeah. long as you are acting in love. Exactly. And I think that's really well, where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we're really saying then too, like, is that love is a behavior, not an emotion, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and we are bound to Christ through a commitment, not because we love him, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah. That make any sense? Well, in fact, I think that accounts for the high divorce rate, the very thing you said, that love is a behavior, not an emotion. How many couples are breaking right. up because they don't feel right. what they used to feel? That's the defining right. element. So in other words, if my next door neighbor, you're supposed to love your neighbor according to Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, if I, I don't really know them that well, but I can go over and cut their grass. 
-hmm. That's a loving behavior. Yeah. I say, I'm going to the grocery store. Can I go for you? You need something from the mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. or you, I'll make groceries for you. What do you need? And so what happens is, is that that, and I don't have to love that person in the sense of an emotional outpouring as long as I can show mm -hmm. loving me. Thanks, Chuck. I feel you know better. What, you I know really what's really <laughs> interesting, there. though, John? What? When you start doing those actions, the emotions will follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit, uh, Tiny, about your daily discipline in terms of how has God led you to structure your day? Well, coming through Teen Challenge, uh, it's a structured program. They teach you every day, three times a day, to pray to the Lord. You pray before breakfast, you pray before lunch, and you pray at dinner. And we spend 30 minutes at a time, you know, to pray at those times. And so you take that practice when you leave the program to pray to the Lord three times a day, just like Daniel did in the book of Daniels. Mm -hmm. Pray to the Lord three times a day. And we put that in practice. You pray and not only pray, you read your word, mm -hmm. you, you meditate on the word, you fast, you, you, you spend time in the word of God. So a man think of, so is he. Whatever you put in, garbage in, garbage out. If you put in the word of God in, then that's what you're going to get come out mm -hmm. when a situation presents itself before you. Um, I used to point the finger and say, God, you need to fix that person. You need to fix them. No, and he'd say, no, I need to fix you. You need to fix your attitude. Mm -hmm. And so God wants us to work on our own attitude. He wants us to get our lives right so we can show the love of Christ to the world. Something about praying that I found in my own life, there was uh, a coworker that I used to really struggle with loving at all. I mean, <laughs> with liking really. And uh, mainly because I felt I had been slighted by this person and made to feel not worthy, um, which is a whole different subject. But what I started to do was pray for this person mm -hmm every day as I was driving into work. And amazingly what happened was then when I would see them, the last thing that would be on my mind fresh would have been that prayer that I prayed for them. And somehow it made it so much easier for me to forgive them yes. if they had done wrong and, and to just express love in small ways. Prayer is a really powerful thing. Mm -hmm. And whether it's specific times throughout the day or whether it's an ongoing conversation, mm -hmm. Um, it's an incredibly powerful thing as far as a, a readjusting your thought patterns, I think, mm -hmm. you know, and the direction of how you're thinking. Disordered eating, especially bulimia, take bulimia and binge eating, so overeating, overeating and purging. Those are very similar to a drug addiction in that you get your fix, which is you eat a whole lot. And then um, in the case of a bulimic, you purge and then it isn't long before you need your fix again. And that's for mental and physical reasons. There's just a lot that goes into that whole cycle. Anorexia, I don't know exactly which that one would be similar to more than maybe the issue of pornography. It's a very private struggle. This is my own private world. I control everything that happens here. Um, I can do whatever I want. It's my body. <laughs> and uh, it starts very simple and then it gradually, progressively gets worse. Uh, the, the more weight you lose as an anorexic, the more you want to lose. The more pornography you view, the more you want to view. You know, in very similar ways, they sort of follow uh, a progression. Um, chronic dieting is sort of a different thing because it's so um, under the radar and it's not as obvious. It's easier for that one to just go unnoticed, maybe differently than some of the others. Maybe like a casual drinker, you know. Yeah, it's normal. It's okay to have a drink at a business meal, so nobody's going to notice there's a problem, but, um, but there is. Um, they, they all have some common similarities, and not the least of which is this feeling that um, this helps me cope. You know, this, the, the drinker, this helps me be more friendly at a party, helps me cope with being shy. The, an, the anorexic or the chronic dieter. This helps me get my body to what I want it to be so that I can cope with what other people think about me. I love how they just stick their butt out in the air. No concern. Where I am right now, you know, I think I still, I still wrestle with um, who I am and who I am becoming. And what I have found is, as much as I have dealt with the eating thing and all of that. I find that 
he has me more in a place now of just constantly on my knees, <laughs> constantly aware that whatever area of my life that it is, that unless I go to him first, um, that it is not, I'm not going to be able to do things on my own. And each time I charge out there and try and do things on my own, whether it's related to how I look or what I weigh, or that aside, it's related to what I'm doing, um, I'm finding again and again that he's, as he's drawing me closer to him, it's less acceptable to him for me to get farther from what his specific will is for my life. And more specifically, it is less acceptable to him for me to not have him be the Lord of every single area in my life. So the journey that I'm on now um, regarded to relating to the eating, that one will continue too. Um, I think that it's the kind of thing where I still, I still um, uh, desire to look good and I still um, appreciate the attention of other people and I have to continually lay that down and continually remember that that is not a goal that I need to have in my life. I suppose that, that I must always be aware of that weakness in my life or it, it'll, it'll get me again. Now this is constant self-evaluation and it always pops up when I'm in a situation where I feel insecure. And I, I will be thinking I'm fine. My relapse could be skipping a meal, you know. But it is a relapse and I will notice it and I will, it, I will be aware then that I don't have this thing licked and that unless I sort of stay aware of it and if I do, I have to continue to self-evaluate or I'll fall right back into it. I mean, it's a, it, I spent 12 years of my life living with a whole different set of priorities. So to expect that they're just suddenly going to go away is foolish. So I've got to just get to this place where I'm comfortable being me and where if the situation calls for looking a certain way, great, but where I'm not ruled by what I look like and what I weigh and what I'm eating. Have you ever gotten impatient with yourself because you keep committing the same sin over and over and over? Let me remind you of something. Now, first of all, I know how that feels. And I wouldn't bring up the problem if I didn't know the solution. When Jesus was here on earth, one day Peter asked him, Lord, how many times should I forgive somebody that has sinned against me? Seven times? I think he felt like he was doing real good. I mean, if they, if they commit a sin seven times against me and they ask me to forgive them, do I forgive them seven times, that many times? Jesus said, no, you forgive them 70 times seven. Well, if the Lord expects me to give that kind of grace and mercy to others, don't you think we only give ourselves at least the same kind of grace and mercy. You say, well, you're just looking for a way that you can keep on sinning and keep on failing and then be forgiven. Let me tell you what the Apostle Paul said. He said, when these trials and these tests and these temptations come, rejoice. Not in the fact that you have failed, but in the fact that it gives you an opportunity to grow and produce character. And that comes through endurance. If we continue to take an inventory of our life, and you know, this is not something you just do one time. It's a daily process, a continual lifetime process. We're to renew our minds daily. We should search ourselves and do an inventory daily of our life. And when we were wrong, promptly admit it. I know for me, personally, when I do things now that I shouldn't do, when I say something that I shouldn't say, I don't wait for two weeks or three weeks or two years to try to make it right. I try to do it immediately. And I promise you something. If you'll start practicing that, if you'll continue to take an inventory of your life daily, and when you're wrong, promptly admit it, you won't do wrong again, maybe two or three times. Why? Because I don't like to go tell my wife 
I was wrong. I don't like to go tell someone else, I shouldn't have said that. I, I was wrong when I said that. I was wrong when I acted that way. If you'll do that by taking an inventory and by going and uh, promptly admitting that you're wrong, it'll cause you the next time it comes up not to react that way. So we're talking about growing. We're not talking about perfection. We're talking about making progress. It is a continual daily process as we look at ourselves, as we make amends to others that we have harmed and continue to do that and trust God, we'll continue to receive a power that supersedes anything we could dream of. So keep on keeping on. Okay, what happens when you blow it? Of course, none of us ever blow it anymore, right? Mm. <laughs> you mean as far as I blow it on a regular see? basis. <clears throat> and it's an opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is. I find uh, the honest facts of my life uh, display the fact that uh, my achievements came easy. And uh, I didn't learn that much. My failures, it took me hard. And in getting up, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And God has been faithful to be with me through all of that and uh, I continue to grow. It just so happens that I grow more when I fail. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the grace of God, I fail on a regular basis. That's excellent. I, I, I had a pastor uh, friend who said, I learned a lot more from my failures than I did my successes. I think you always will. I, I think the hardest thing probably is that once we get this label of Christian, mm -hmm. we think somehow we are going to be perfect. I think, I think this is one of, the, one of the reasons why so many people within the church congregations get in trouble, mm -hmm. but they don't come mm -hmm. to let anybody know about it because to be a Christian means you're going to be this way. But my idea of a Christian is just being honest. And when you don't have it together, don't say you have it together. And when you need help, say you need help. And that's what I've learned today. That's right. You know, there's a lot of people that get caught up and the addictions we're talking about here today, mm -hmm. they're sitting out there every Sunday morning listening to a sermon. But what we have to do, I think, as helpers, or whether you do it in a private sector like with Mark or as a counselor, mm -hmm. we have to say, my door's open. I don't care what you've done. And, and somehow get that message across. Mm -hmm. Because there's people who suffer Sunday after Sunday after Sunday in, in the house with the Lord where they are so close I mean, that's like being right at the door. Right. But, and, and that, that's why as a preacher, I've always tried not to get into one of those goody two-shoes deals. And I'm not putting any goody two-shoes preachers down, although there are some, of them wouldn't. but the point being is that let people know that this Christianity is a real thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's not pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. And it works. And it works, mm -hmm. it works, and you ain't gonna have it together every day, 24 seven. But when you screw up, get with a mentor, get with somebody and say, hey, come on, I need Amen. you to pray for me. I ask my people at my church pray for me all the time. Yes. Yeah. And so boy said to me, he said, well, he said, look, he said, they'll think you don't have it all together. And I said, you fool, I don't have it all together. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. And I, think, I had it all together once and forgot where I put it. I, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Or somebody stole it. Hate it when that yeah. happens. Yeah. You know, Does I that think, make sense of not being a phony about this thing? Well, I think if, if we are phony about it, then we are gradually giving the enemy more ground to hold that against oh, us dear. and hold it over us, which yeah. only pushes us farther and farther yeah. into the the way that he would have us to go, which is to take us completely out of the route yeah. of, again, God's purpose for our exactly. life, because that's yeah. what all of this comes exactly. back to. Exactly. I think that's the first response, the first human response to sin. I think it's the first thing Adam did, Adam and Eve, both. As mm -hmm. soon as they had sinned, run, cover up, which is phoniness, mm -hmm. yeah. pathetic fig leaves, and make excuses. <coughs> yeah. and, and I think Blind. for me, the biggest challenge when mm -hmm. I fail is to not run away, which is yeah. my first big temptation. If I really blew mm -hmm. it, I'm out of here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if I can't run away, to try to cover it up. Mm -hmm. a, a lie about it, avoid it, sweep it under yeah. the carpet. Or if I really have to admit it, at least find somebody else to pin it on. Right. Or, you, you know, blame somebody else. <laughs> and, and so I think the great challenge is not to go to that extreme because I find as an addict, yeah. my personality is extreme. Right. 
Right. Yes. If I'm up, everything is great. And if there's a if there's a problem, it's never just a problem. It's a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. and, and so, to to learn to deal with failure honestly means basically doing what Adam and Eve had to do: sit and listen while God says, "Okay, there will be consequences. This is the provision I will make to help you through it, and you can deal with it." Mm -hmm. And, and that, I think for yeah. me, that's the great sort of strengthening experience yeah. of failure is when it happens, son of a gun. If I am willing to face it, I really can deal with it and it will be okay. Promptly mm -hmm. admit it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Promptly yeah. admit it. And, and, and God's going to discipline me. He disciplines me all the time. Mm -hmm. And I like that because, yep. you know, it's like if he didn't love me, he wouldn't be disciplined. That's right. Chasing those. That's know. absolutely right. How I deal with failure is uh, First for me is to take responsibility for it. Immediately I must take responsibility for it because again, my middle name was Justification. And I get into danger of setting myself up um, to get into a worse situation. It'll snowball if I don't do that. And it's a hard thing to do. And that applies to my job, that applies to relationships um, in the community and with my family. Is to immediately look at the situation where I failed and say, what did I do? that I know to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Taking it to God and admitting my responsibility in it and asking for his forgiveness and being accountable. I find it's, um, yes. it's hard for recovering addicts to be accountable, yeah. you know, especially when you're doing good. You don't want anybody to know that you failed yeah. and I look all good and cleaned up now, you yeah. know, but it, not to do so is to set myself up. That's so. Right. Um, I thank God every day for the accountability in my life. I had another plan that looked exactly like this and I wrecked it so many times that it's, it's just demolished. So I went and bought another plane to try to put it together so I could fly again. I remember just growing up, as I was growing up, we always ate. It was, it was just a thing in the evenings, we'd have dinner, we'd be full and would sit around and watch, eat popcorn and watch TV and that kind of stuff. And I think as I grew up, uh, going into junior high school and I got a little bit more control where I could um, cook things for myself, you know, I'd go in the kitchen and just kind of start cooking up some stuff. And, and I found that over the years, I spent a lot of time eating at nighttime and I would eat and then I'd get full and then I'd watch TV for a while and then I might, you know, I might eat some more and then I wait a few more minutes, maybe 30 or 45 minutes or 10 sometimes, and then I eat again. I feel like a, like a heroin junkie. I mean, you get a hit or something, you feel great for a moment, the next thing you know, you're, you've got to have it again, and it's, it's a real out of control feeling. So I noticed even as an adult, that at nighttime I'm eating, um, watching TV, I'm eating again, and it has really, it's, it's, I guess as I notice, it has less and less to do with hunger. It's, it's a, this, this unpeacefulness inside, it's, it's a nervousness and I guess, I mean, over the years I've just, I've read enough books and, and watched enough, you know, programs to realize that, that it's rarely the thing that I'm doing that's the problem. I'm just eating to medicate or eating to try to ease, like, um, I guess the, the nervousness that I have. And uh, not that long ago, maybe three or four weeks ago, I, I had a very light dinner. Um, and I just thought, you know, I'm going to do that tonight. I'm just going to see what I can do. And I just went to bed. I watched a little television. I was a little bit hungry, but I had made up my mind. I didn't want to eat, and I just went to sleep. And I woke up the next day feeling so much better. And you're going to have some bad nights where you just go binge again and don't beat yourself up about it. Just, you know, live it and, and just get over it and, and try to do better the next night. And I'd say in the last three weeks, um, almost every night I've, I've had dinner and that's it. I mean, there's probably been three or four nights where I've gone crazy and I've gone pretty crazy and just raided the refrigerator. But as, as a general rule, I'm beginning to learn not to eat and not to be, I guess, enslaved to the desires or whatever, whatever that is. But uh, it's a lot more peaceful. I wake, up a lot, I wake up feeling better. I lost five pounds the first week just by not eating. I don't know how many meals I eat at night, but it's a lot. And I'd say every year it's better Every six months it's probably better, but it's a healing process for me and I, maybe the food is my medicine that I take to, to make me feel like everything's going to be okay. I don't really know. My life's a wreck. How's that? It's just held together by epoxy, probably. I mean, it's just, it's always broken. I'm always fixing it and uh, it'll never fly perfectly, I guess. Well, I think we've heard some things this week that have reminded us something that <laughs> we already knew. 
and that is that we're not perfect. Oh, how we want to be. We want to be. But you know what? God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people that are willing to make progress. And that's what this is all about. We've made a decision, we've made a commitment, and yet we've failed. We did wrong again. What do we do? We ask for forgiveness. Remember what he tells us in the scripture? Brethren, I write to you that you sin not. But if you do, we have an advocate with the Father, someone to plead our case for us. And if we'll confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, when I do wrong now, I make amends real quick because I don't like to live in that pain and that guilt and that shame anymore. Now that I know that I don't have to, but I have to be willing to make it right and admit it when I fail. Why don't you do the same thing and you can enjoy the benefit right now, right there where you are. Why don't you just say, God, forgive me. That's all you have to do. God, forgive me. And when we ask, we receive. That's the promise. And the reason that's the promise is because God gave us life that we might be free. Let's stay that way. Have you been inspired to start your journey to recovery? Please call our toll-free number, 888-665-4483. And our prayer partners can help you find a group in your area. Or you can visit our website at www.ctvn.org and click on the Born to be Free link. There you can search our online database of recovery groups near you. When you call or visit our website, request your free copy of the self-help booklet, Your Dynamic Journey to Freedom. In it, you'll find an outline of the recovery process featured in this series. So take that first step on your journey to freedom by contacting us, finding a local recovery group, and getting your free copy of this inspiring booklet. Call now because you were born to be free. It seemed like God was right there saying, are you done yet? Are you gonna do it my way? Until finally the last time, he said, what are you gonna do now? And I said, whatever you want me to do, I'm done. And that was it. That I no longer go with my hand out that I'm able to actually meet needs in their lives, that God is using me, that God is using me, me. Such an honor to be used by Him. I really resisted um, people saying, without God, you can't really get better. I think I was burned out on that. But with God and going to Him as the source, then it enables me not to replace this addiction with another one. And it gives me sort of a touchstone of being in balance with sort of a, a God who is Lord of my life and everything else revolving around that instead of an element of my life being the Lord of my life.